Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is great, an overflow room. We're hoping the fire department doesn't show up. Um, I want to, we just learned, I want to give a special shout out to area high school students in the back that have just joined us uh, here at the end. Um, uh, these students, I'm told, are with the floating classroom, working on lake ecology and Cuga Lake, so thank you very, very much. Um, next generation of environmentalists and ecologists. Um, we're going to need replacement troops based on the number of gray hairs I'm seeing in the room. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming out on this warm winter evening. What could that be about? Yeah, we asked for it. We stated it purposely, you know. We asked for it. Put in a special request. Um, I'm Barbara Lifton, most of you probably know me. Uh, I'm the Assemblywoman for the 125th Assembly District. That's all of Tompkins County. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. You didn't let me get in Cortland County. I'm in <laughs> Cortland County too. Uh, this, this panel discussion tonight is a great example, I think, of people who've been thinking globally and acting globally, many of them thinking locally and acting locally. We got sort of a new paradigm going. It's not just think globally, act locally, but uh, continual iterations of this. Thinking locally, acting locally, thinking about state and federal levels, acting there as well, as many of you I know in the room are uh, too. Uh, and also not just at different levels, uh, but also through, throughout the different sectors, public, private, not-for-profit. Um, you know, we clearly see uh, <laughs> Uh, people that are engaged more and more, many, many of us are engaged at uh, as many levels as we can find the energy to do in our, in our daily lives. All of these people on the panel here went to uh, the Conference of the Parties, COP21 in Paris in November and December, where they were part of an amazing global, local movement uh, on climate change. And I know that we're all eager to hear uh, their thoughts on what they experienced and uh, how they think it applies to the work that's happening here locally and the state and federal level. Let me quickly introduce our moderator for the evening, uh, Professor Todd Cowan, and he will introduce the panel and um, moderate this panel. So uh, Professor Cowan, who is right there, yes, over on my, my left, you're right. Uh, professor Cowan is a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Cornell. He specializes in environmental fluid mechanics and smart energy systems. Professor Cowan is the Atkinson Center for Sustainable Futures Faculty Director of Energy. So welcome, Professor Cowan, and take it away. Thank you very much. So thank you, Assemblywoman Lifton. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Uh, I will just pick up slightly on, on why we're here and sort of why COP21 got us here, not COP20 or before that. Uh, as Assemblywoman Lifton said, COP21 was uh, the 21st Conference of the Parties, taking place, of course, in Paris. A lot happened in Paris this year, so I'm sure everyone knows it was in Paris. Um, but many of you are aware that last year, uh, the 20th, taking place in Copenhagen, got us close, but nothing really happened. And if we go all the way back to the first, Kyoto, uh, a lot of excitement back in 1997 about what was started. We are now 21 years later, and for the first time, after 21 COP meetings, we finally have something has happened. So it's with great pleasure that we're here tonight to discuss with six people who are actually attending that meeting uh, to hear their perspective both on the meetings and where we go forward um, because the work is just beginning. Uh, we finally have a, sort of the green light. Um, so I'd like to take a moment and thank the Tompkins County Planning Board. I think Ed Marks <laughs> is here tonight for co-sponsoring this event along with the Tompkins County Climate Protection Initiative. And I think I saw Peter Bordaglia in the back of the room. There he is. Uh, so for both those groups for co-sponsoring our event, um, I would also point out to everybody, and it's, as is somewhat obvious, this event is being taped. Um, we will have an opportunity to hear from each of the uh, participants for uh, about three to five minutes. And then we are going to open the floor to questions. I will moderate those questions. Uh, we uh, are going to strictly limit um, the audience to two minutes per, uh, per speaker for a question, as we would like to get as many people in to be able to uh, ask questions as possible. Um, uh, so I think I've covered all the ground rules. And with that, I would like to turn it over to 
uh, Bob Howarth. Uh, uh, actually, I think what I'll do, and rather than try to do this back and forth, is I'm going to introduce all the panelists, and then I will turn it over to Bob Howarth. I caught Bob by surprise there. Good. Uh, so I thought we had a game plan. We did have a game plan, but you know, I was ad living a little there. I just seen if you were awake. Uh, so Bob Howarth is an Earth System scientist who has worked on global change issues at Cornell for over 30 years. He is a leading authority on how methane influences the greenhouse gas footprint of shale gas and is the second author of the 2013 paper that lays out a path for New York to be free of fossil fuels by 2030. To Bob's right, to your audience's left, we have Sandra Steingraber. Sandra is a biologist, author, and distinguished scholar in residence at Ithaca College. She attended COP21 in Paris wearing two hats. As the co-founder of Concerned Health Professionals of New York, she gave an invited presentation on the public health impacts of shale gas extraction. As a science journalist, she reported from Paris on assignment for the online news magazine EcoWatch. And to Sandra's right, we have Johannes Lehman. Johannes is a professor of soil biogeochemistry and soil fertility management at Cornell, a leading global authority on biochar. His work focuses on soil organic matter dynamics and sustainable land management. He is the editor-in-chief of the journal Nutrient Cycling in Agri and Agroecosystems. To his right is Karen Pincus. Karen is a professor of Romance Studies and Comparative Literature at Cornell. Her focus is climate change and the humanity's role in addressing it. Her forthcoming book, Fuel, unravels the fantasy that we can simply replace fossil fuels without having to make other changes. She is at work on a new project, Terrains of Climate Change, that draws on literature, film, art, and critical theory. And to her right is Alison Chatrachan. Alison is the director of the Cornell Institute for Climate Change and Agriculture. Her research focuses on interactions between social and environmental systems and works to reconcile stakeholder beliefs public policy, and institutions. And to her right, we have Colleen Bowen. Colleen is a 2001 Cornell graduate. She is currently on the steering committee of We Are Seneca Lake and the represented the group at COP. She also serves as board chair of House with Heart, a home for abandoned children in Kathmandu, Nepal. She is a retired US Air Force senior master sergeant. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over now to Bob Howard. <laughs> Thank you, Todd, and thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I was at the COP21 meeting for 10 days, first few days as an uh, unofficial hanger-on, and then for a week as one of the Cornell representatives. There were literally hundreds of events, uh, side events mostly, going on at COP throughout that time. Uh, I concentrated on, on going to three different types. I went to ones on uh, methane and other short-lived climate pollutants. So there was a lot going on at COP on that. I went to ones on uh, anti-fracking and shale gas activities, and I went to uh, ocean meetings as well. In the uh, four minutes or so I have tonight, I want to give you the, uh, my take home message of what happened. This COP is really important because 195 nations of the world, all of the major nations of the world, came together and agreed that we must keep the planet of the Earth well below 2 degrees Celsius and that any temperature rise above 1.5 degrees Celsius is going to cause serious harm to the planet and to society. Every single country said that. In terms of where we are, what the, that's a very, very uh, aggressive target. It also is a, uh, it's, it's what the scientific community and the island nations of the world were, were asking for. It's what we need if we're going to protect the planet. In terms of where we are now, we've already warmed the planet by one degree Celsius. We're on target to warm it to 1.5 degrees. And again, that's the COP says we're dangerous territory once we reach there. We're on target to reach that in 12 years from now. We're on trajectory to be at two degrees, which is way too high, well above what the, the nations of the world now say is acceptable, and we'll be at that temperature in 35 degrees. So we have a lot of work to do. To meet the Paris Accord, I think there's strong agreement among the climate scientists who work on this that the United States needs to be carbon free by 2030 to 2035, largely carbon free. And we need to move even more aggressively to get rid of shale gas and natural gas. And let me give you a little diversion on that in my few minutes. We need to reduce carbon dioxide. We've already put 90% of the amount of carbon dioxide we can into the atmosphere and keep the temperature of the Earth well below 2 degrees Celsius. So we can't afford to put much more carbon dioxide up there. 
But no matter what we do for carbon dioxide over the coming years and decade, the planet will continue to warm to 1.5 degrees in 12 years and to 2 degrees in 35 years unless we cut methane emissions. The planet responds much, much faster to methane than to carbon dioxide. So there's a lot of talk at the COP21 that yes, we need to start looking at these short-lived climate pollutants. We need to focus attention on them. We need to do it internationally in the next two or three years. So we need to cut methane. Where is methane coming from? The major source in the United States is the natural gas industry. There's no question about that. And there's good evidence that shale gas development has accelerated that and perhaps doubled the methane emissions from the natural gas industry uh, because of that. So this completely undercuts the idea that natural gas is a bridge fuel. It cannot be a bridge fuel if we're to meet the, the uh, COP21 targets. Uh, the COP21 asked for the scientific community through the IPCC to do an assessment on what needs to be done to reach these new targets because what the nations have already agreed to won't get us there. It'll take us to 3.5 to 4 degrees. The IPCC is scheduled to come out uh, in 18 months with a preliminary report on that. I believe they'll tell you what I've just said. We have got to get rid of natural gas if we're to get that target. Another message out of Paris is that the accord came about uh, not because of some sudden surge of international leadership, but because of grassroots activity. And if we are to have the COP21 target work and reach this target of 1.5 degrees, it's going to come about because of what we do in Tompkins County and because of what we do in New York and what that leads to. I must say I was, I was uh, pleasantly surprised when I was at several side events in, in, in Paris that uh, many people in the international world know about Tompkins County. I was at an anti-fracking summit. <laughs> there are people from all over the world there, all five continents, and they all seem to know about Tompkins County. <laughs> So that shows what you can do with local leadership and local activity, and I think we need to lead the way towards New York State, out of this county, and the rest of the country, the rest of the world will follow. So I was very pleased uh, to be there. It was an important meeting. I was honored to be there, and I was very thankful that Cornell let me represent them. So thank you for coming tonight. Wow, I'm standing here touching Bob Howarth's DNA. <laughs> this is a great honor. Hi everyone, I'm Sandra Steingraver, and indeed I am the sole representative tonight from that institution of higher education on the other hill, Ithaca College. And as you heard, I went to Paris wearing two hats. As a public health biologist and a co-founder of New Yorkers Against Fracking, I gave invited presentations on the health risks and harms of fracking, both inside the official venue, which is called La Berger, and also at gatherings of civil society groups outside of the official proceedings. And in that capacity, I spoke right out of this report, the Compendium of Scientific Medical and Media Findings Demonstrating the Risks and Harms of Fracking. And without further comment, I'm actually just going to pass this document around for those who are interested. Bob, can you do that for me? Sure, of course. Um, and I will certainly accept questions about it, but I'm going to focus my um, prepared remarks tonight on the other identity I wore there, which was as an accredited science journalist on assignment for EcoWatch. So my press pass gave me extraordinary access to gatherings all over Paris, ranging from $1,000 a plate convocations with renewable energy CEOs and their would-be financiers, to press conferences featuring speakers who were addressed by the press corps as your excellency to international music concerts and very tense dramatic demonstrations and confrontations by activists who, because of the state of emergency in France following the November 13 terrorist attacks, were basically forced to react to a martial law situation. So a few words about the process of the treaty negotiations went on, which went on for the better part of two weeks. Each nation brought teams of negotiators as well as their ministers of the environment and for the United States. Our team was led by Secretary of State John Kerry. And of course, to set the tone at the start of the meetings, the heads of state from almost every, all the world's nations were gathered together inside La Berger. And in this, the negotiators and the ministers, including the UN Secretary himself, Ban Ki-moon, they weren't sequestered away like jurors um, as they negotiated. They weren't separated from the kaleidoscope of what Bob mentioned, all these different plenary sessions, debates, summits, protests, and media events that were going on all around them. 
but they, instead they existed in a kind of dynamic relationship with them. They gave and received messages, they took meetings, they emerged and made announcements, and all the press kind of gathered around to hear what they had to say. They were entreated and conjoled and pressured and tweeted at. Um, and, and each one of these media events that they participated in was attended by hundreds of journalists, which were then also tweeting out and covering the stories. And throughout it all, my sense, um, as somebody who kind of brought my witness eye to this whole circus, was that the mood was remarkably cooperative. It was urgent, it was determined, it was in good faith. I don't think it was in any sense cynical, although there were certainly forces at work trying to undermine and neutralize the treaty at every turn. So my sense throughout these days is we all watched the unresolved issues debated and argued. What would the time scale be? What would the temperature target turn out to be? Who pays for all this? How will climate commitments be verified? I felt like I was watching a little ship navigate through stormy waters. And nearly every day, something threatened to capsize this little boat or dash it against the rocks. Some days, the force of you know, destruction was Saudi Arabia. And then Venezuela would come and try to undermine things. On, on other days, it was our own nation, the United States. It would introduce a clause or a push for a revision of a number that would sabotage the treaty or weaken it. But then almost always, there was pushback, right? Sometimes from the world's climate scientists who, who flew in at the, at, at the last minute and kind of rescued things. And often from a block of island nations uh, led by the Philippines called the most vulnerable nations. And because of them, stronger language prevailed. And it also prevailed because of this presence of civil society um, as well as the business community who, was, who pushed and pushed the, the leaders and said we're waiting for a strong signal from political leaders so that investment dollars can flow in this other direction and, and no longer toward fossil fuel. So to the treaty itself, I think it's a pretty strong document. It has good bones. The science is sound. There are pledges in place for almost every nation, and there's a ratchet mechanism to make the pledges more significant um, over time. So where we're at now is that I see this as a great race. Um, I see it as a race, like, the, I, I agree with Bill McGibbon when he said this is a great treaty for 1995. So the, the, the problem is <coughs> that what's missing is what we can't add anymore, which is time, or out of time. So all this remarkable transformation happens, has to happen extremely rapidly. So th my reason for hope and, am and ambition and optimism and all this is that at the same time we have two great forces <coughs> remaining to push. And one of them is this amazing grassroots movement that's springing up to form a powerful global climate justice movement. But the other is the business community. Oddly, I spent a lot of time hanging out with these guys. And they're very serious when they're asking for an ambitious catalytic agreement, and I'm quoting now, an ambitious catalytic agreement that signals an irreversible <coughs> shift to a new global economy. When I talk to these CEOs, they're not worried about climate denying US Republicans um, running for office, they're worried about financial in instruments. And especially irksome is the idea that the mechanism by which developing, developed nations get to help developing nations to go renewable has a budget of $100 billion. Um, and while the fossil fuel industry still gets subsidies of over $500 billion. And that sends the wrong signal to business and financial leaders. So you heard what Bob said, we have until about 2035 to turn this around. La Berge, COP21 happened in 2015. So that's 20 years. I'm turning 57. I'm turning 57 years old this year, and I'll be 77 in, in 2035. I'm devoting the rest of my life to this race to close the door on fossil fuels and open the door on renewables. That's the great work in front of us, and I invite you all to join us. Thank you very much. My name is Johannes Lehmann. Um, uh, a UN convention is an awesome assembly of people and quite a frustrating beast as well. You have to imagine that the, all these countries sitting in one room, similar to you now, quite a big, uh, big room uh, it is, and, and talk about an accord that uh, the, the globe that should secure uh, the future of, uh, of the globe. And, and that is, a, that is a huge undertaking. Um, and it's, so it's no wonder that it has taken so long that even the minimum um, could be achieved. 
Um, I've been to other climate conventions. I was in Poland in 2008. I was in Copenhagen in, uh, in 2009, which was dubbed Hopenhagen, but turned out to be anything but hope. Um, and, and so there was a lot of trepidation this time as well, um, that we wouldn't end up with another non-Hopenhagen, um, <laughs> that we would end up with no hope. Um, but it turned out to be very, very different this time, and, and, and you could feel it. Um, <clears throat> in Copenhagen, um, there was, from the beginning, a lot of unrest, a lot of uncertainty. It didn't go forward, um, a lot of expectations, but, but uh, there was no preparation. And, and uh, one of the big differences this time was that um, uh, France has done an amazing job in, in preparing uh, this convention. Uh, they don't only have great food and, and even better wine, um, and that all helped, I'm sure. Um, but, but they, they uh, did a lot of groundwork before, and, and, and that shows also what leadership can do. Um, there were some fortuitous changes in, in governments right before the, the convention, and, and that helped surely as well. Um, from my perspective as a scientist, um, the UN convention process is really a, a huge opportunity. This is as close to political decision making as you can get. Um, I, I, I think science can be relevant um, and, and I, I have the hope that, um, that we can be relevant and be very close. So you have to imagine that um, I might be standing here at a side event that we had uh, as a Cornell uh, community. We organized a side event uh, around food security and climate change. Uh, and literally, maybe over there in the next room uh, where the stacks are, um, they're the negotiators. And you see them with their pink, pink tags, uh, so you can identify them. This is somebody from a country. This is somebody from a country. Um, and they might be sitting in here and then go back into the ne negotiations. And, and, and our hope is that they take something of what we say with them into these negotiations. Um, I've been looking for the word agriculture and especially soil, I'm a soil scientist, so I'm slightly biased, um, in the negotiating text in the final accord and I, and, and I didn't find it anywhere. Um, so agriculture is not in the accord. Uh, climate change mitigation or adaptation to climate, uh, to climate change is not in, in the accord. Forestry is in there. Um, so was I there in vain? No, I don't think so. I, I, I will go again. But maybe the most important thing and the, the most exciting uh, aspect of, of these COPs um, is really the, the youth movement um, and, and all the, the young people who are there. And, and there were many, many uh, more young people than there were academics there. Um, it's actually teeming with young people and they're excited about it. They, they, they feel what, that they can be there uh, when, when important decisions are made, they might have impact on it. They're very close to, to big decision makers. And I, and I think that to nurture this new generation um, of climate scientists, activists, and concerned citizens is, is really, really important. And, and, and I hope um, we all see each other uh, in Marrakesh in November. Thank you. So um, I wanted to uh, just say a couple of remarks and, and talk about a couple of terms. Um, the first one is just a remark. Um, Paris was, for me, unbelievably exciting to be around people, young, old, from all over the world who all were as um, traumatized and afraid and excited and scared as I am in my day-to-day -day life and realize that I'm not alone. Uh, but ever since I got back from Paris, um, everything, all the terms and all the excitement and all the fear and anxiety that I heard at COP have completely disappeared from the U.S. media and have been replaced by some other events which seem to be taking place and some individuals who have large personalities who seem to have taken things over as well. So to me, this is also something to be very cautious about because if there's going to be any momentum to come out of Paris, um, the work has to have started many decades ago, and we can't really afford to sort of brush it aside because there are other more, apparently more interesting things for the media to report on. 
Um, just to follow up a little bit on what Johanna said about the negotiating process, um, as someone who studies language and literature, for me it was fascinating to sit in on the negotiations where um, there would be a discussion, all in English by the way, and these are from people all over the world whose native language is not English, talking about syllables, comma, comma placement, um, and very precise terminology. And it's, it's, there's an incredible amount at stake in this. I mean, just to give one example, in one of the draft documents that I saw, the African nations, because many African nations banded together to form a coalition so they could have more power in the negotiations, they asked for the, um, the document to say something about their right to electricity. But by the, if you read the final document, the word right has been excised and the word electricity has been taken out. And instead, there's a comment about Africa's um, commitments to renewable energy. That's really significant because um, it's, it's a kind of watering down and, and a um, dissolving of some kind of precise <coughs> ideas and problems to a more sort of general uh, dream, uh, and that's, that's, that's something we're going to have to face. Another word that I heard a lot, which was interesting in the context, was indigenous. So people talked about rights of the indigenous, but um, at a certain point what I realized is that talking about rights of the indigenous is not talking about um, small marginalized groups or cultures that have existed in the past that we would like to see exist out of some kind of folkloric or nostalgic desire, but it's actually people living daily life. People that are called indigenous who are asking for rights within the framework of the COP are basically just farmers, and there's nothing more to it than that. And it's incredibly profound that they actually have to ask for rights in this document and that they may not have the rights. Those rights are just simply existence for them. Um, finally, um, a couple of more things. The term geoengineering, it's something I'm interested in. Um, it's a complicated issue. Uh, there are different views on it. It's very controversial. There are aspects of it that are more controversial, aspects that are less controversial but the word was very uh, seldom used at the COP. There were panels and side events on the question of sequestering, capturing carbon, um, sequestering it either in plants or in soil or burying it under the North Sea or burying it into the subsurface and various other possibilities about that. But basically, all of the talk about carbon neutrality, uh, there was very little talk about a plan B if, and I believe that we will not transition fast enough to uh, renewable energy, what are we going to do? And not only what are we going to do, but how are we going to govern that? How are we going to come to some kind of a democratic way of a plan B, C, D, E, and so on and so forth? So that to me was very interesting. Um, I think uh, uh, either Johannes mentioned that the word soil was not in the final accord. Of course, the word geoengineering wasn't in the accord. The, word, uh, carbon, the words carbon sequestration were not in the accord. Even the word nature wasn't in the accord. <laughs> in any case, um, to take a little bit of a different view from Bob, I'm, for example, much more pessimistic than he is, or probably almost anybody else on this panel. Um, but in any case, um, Bob talked about what we do, and I think that's absolutely legitimate, and it's wonderful, and it's wonderful to see people engaged. But I also think there's a, a problem or a potential issue that if we talk about we, we feel good about we, but we forget that we are a very small uh, segment of the population in a very small part of the world, and we may be very little when we think about the enormous capital and investments and infrastructure of the big carbon institutions that we're up against. So on that very pessimistic note, I will turn it over to my colleague, Allison. <laughs> Climate Change and Agriculture, I had the great privilege to try 
and make sure that Cornell University had a presence at COP and working with the Atkinson Center very closely. We worked for very many months to make sure we were there. We were privileged to get two spots um, inside the UN zone, and so we had the two of us go for each week. So my role there was to set up a Cornell exhibit um, for the first two weeks of the COP, and so I ended up spending a lot of time at the booth um, talking about the Climate Smart Farming program that we have, the great capacity of Cornell um, research and extension and education work in this field, and just it was amazing to see how many Cornell alumni came to our booth from all over the world um, to just people who knew about Ithaca, knew about our university, and wanted to learn more about what we're doing. The other thing that we did was organize a side event, and we were very fortunate to partner with UNDP and the IRD Institute from France to focus a panel on climate change and global food security and nutrition issues, and we hope to continue this partnership. So I also wanted to talk about my perspectives on COP as a political scientist. And I agree with, there's been some, um, some challenges and some criticism of the outcome of COP21, that it doesn't go far enough. And as a political scientist who studied international agreements, I can say I agree with one climate scientist, Christopher Christopher Fields, who says, I think this Paris outcome is going to change the world. We didn't solve the problem, but we laid the foundation. So we've had a climate agreement on the books since 1992, and the Kyoto Protocol in place since 1997. However, the United States never ratified that, and actually the um, Kyoto Protocol runs out in 2020, which is why negotiators have been working every single year um, they'll be working mid-year to um, get ready for the next COP. It happens every year. And so why we can think about why has it been so difficult? Well, we have to think about there's 196 countries that have to agree on what they can do and to change their global economies is very, very difficult. So the COP negotiations were vastly different in their approach, and that's why I think we've laid a successful foundation. The Paris conference allowed a much more flexible and inclusive approach. So ahead of the conference, um, each country in the world was asked to submit, submit their intended nationally determined contribution, or their INDC. And there were over 160 submissions from 187 countries, both big and small, poor and wealthy, that each one of them is going to come up with their own plan very flexibly of how they can reduce emissions. So it's, I think, the, one of the best outcomes from Paris is that we have this approach in place, but it's up to each of us in all of our countries to make sure that our nation is living up to its agreements. The other thing that I wanted to, to focus on is that I spent a great deal of my time actually um, spending time with friends from Armenia where I've done research and that country there, I printed out the INDC for the United States is five pages. You can go to the um, climate change website for the COP and print it out. The UN, INDC for Armenia is actually seven pages long. So they provided more information than our country. Um, it's pretty interesting to see what they are proposing to do. Um, we have to remember, I think, that climate change is going to affect the least developed countries around the world, and we have to keep that in mind and do everything that we can to help these countries. So climate change is going to affect Armenia and um, very drastically because it's a high mountainous country where it gets a lot of its water from uh, <coughs> precipitation and runoff from uh, mountainous areas. So with climate change, there's going to be expected droughts and the country is very much of an agricultural country. So I, too, um, highlight what um, Johannes indicated. I wish there was a great deal of focus at COP21 on agriculture. Um, the African countries were there saying no agriculture, no deal. Um, they didn't get agriculture written into the agreement, um, likely because the United States didn't want that to happen. But there is a great deal of focus on agriculture and adaptation 
and um, I think it's up to all of us to make sure that we are um, living up to what we agreed to in helping countries to adapt. So thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm Colleen Boland and I'm a Cornell alum and a founding member of We Are Seneca Lake, a citizen-based grassroots campaign that seeks to protect Seneca Lake and the greater Finger Lakes region from fossil fuel expansion in the form of gas storage. I'd like to thank Lauren and the Atkinson Center for having us tonight. I'm a bit starstruck, I must admit, being here tonight with these folks, uh, but I'm absolutely delighted to hear their reflections on what was for me a most extraordinary moment in time. And can I just say about these folks that they rocked it in Paris. <laughs> and they represented us tirelessly and with great distinction. As a representative of We Are Seneca Lake, my role at COP21 was as a member of what the COP called civil society. This label was used for citizen-based advocacy groups of all kinds who had gathered outside the official summit to bear witness, exert pressure, watchdog the proceedings, speak truth to power, change the media narrative, and otherwise appeal to the better angels of those who were inside negotiating on behalf of the citizenry of the entire planet. Civil society held its own alternative climate summit complete with lectures, skill-sharing workshops, film screenings, art shows, music concerts, and even a mock trial with Exxon as the defendant. <laughs> we braved tight security to demonstrate in the streets. On one pivotal day, while surrounded by no fewer than 32 gendarmes carrying a lot of serious weaponry, we staged an anti-fracking demonstration immediately outside the official venue. We called out the names of political leaders inside who had betrayed the public trust by claiming the mantle of climate leader while opening the lands for further build out of natural gas infrastructure. These were all extraordinary experiences. The sense of urgency that 40,000 people brought to the City of Light was palpable. It was intense, illuminating, sometimes frightening, but in the end emboldening. I can assure you that in Paris, Civil society began the work of uniting us in a global climate justice movement. I left Paris with a reaffirmation that we are indeed in big trouble and that the fossil fuel party must end. New mantras are in order and since I entered the Twitter world along with Dr. Howard here, I think in hashtags now. So we must hashtag keep it in the ground. We must Hashtag, shut it all down. Yeah. I'll close with a few additional observations from Paris, but let me first tell you a little bit more about We Are Seneca Lake and the work that we're doing right here at home. The We Are Seneca Lake movement opposes Texas-based energy company Crestwood Midstream's plans for methane and LPG storage in crumbling salt mines underneath Seneca Lake's hillside. Their stated intention is to turn the Finger Lakes region into a frack gas transportation and storage hub for the entire Northeast. We don't intend to let that happen. And over the past 16 months, we have blockaded the gates of Crestwood. <laughs> so over the past 16 months, we've blocked the gates of Crestwood 47 times, which have resulted in 480 arrests of ordinary citizens, moms, dads, health professionals, people of faith, and most recently, veterans. Some of us have gone to jail. Our reputation here at home is pretty badass. <laughs> but in Paris, I met some activists from around the globe who are out there building encampments, digging tunnels to avoid eviction by the police at protest sites. They are sacrificing other life pursuits to bar the door to fossil fuel build out. I met many of these activists at the International Anti-Fracking Summit, which brought together groups from 40 different countries on five continents. Bob and, Sandra, excuse me, Bob and Sandra spoke to us there, Bob on the science, and Sandra, Sandra gave us a memorable and sorely needed pep talk on how to maintain hope. 
While there, I was gratified to learn that We Are Seneca Lake has a bit of a rock star reputation of its own. Time and again, Sandra and I heard that We Are, we are Seneca Lake is being watched closely around the world and that we are a source of inspiration. Many are learning from us. I, I was most surprised by a gentleman from Indonesia who came up to me and said thank you. So we're doing something right here. And that recharged my own batteries to come back home to fight harder, which is what we absolutely must do. At the big march on the final day that brought 10,000 people out on the streets of Paris, two things became clear to me. First, we all serve as lightning bolts for each other, re-energizing one another as we headed back to our respective homes, knowing that we've got a long, hard fight ahead of us, but also knowing now that we are not alone. We have many brothers and sisters in this fight. And second, that, it, that it's all up to us. Civil society is the compliance mechanism for the Paris Agreement. The UN police aren't coming around the corner to enforce this treaty. And since I've been back home, here's my third and final insight. While the rest of the world understands the urgency and the reality of the climate crisis, sadly and still, the United States, with all its resources and all its ingenuity, has yet to show the political will to chart the course that is required of us now. Sadly, that failure of leadership not only includes our government, but our institution of higher education as well. In the last 48 hours, we have learned that Cornell University now falls into that category. The Board of Trustees have decided not to divest from fossil fuels. And two days ago, Cornell's president announced she would reverse course on Cornell's climate action plan that strive to make the campus carbon neutral by 2035. She said she believes that universities should emphasize sustainability research and train the next generation in a way that will be sensitive and proactive. As a, core, as a Cornell graduate, I am disappointed and ashamed. President Garrett, Cornell is greater than that. And Cornell's focus should be on saving the next generation. As a citizen who has stood out at the gates of Crestwood Midstream along with hundreds of others in polar vortexes and heat waves <laughs> to shut down climate killing infrastructure, I am outraged at my alma mater's failure to engage with the biggest existential crisis ever faced by humanity. The trustees and the president's decisions take us in exactly the wrong direction and it undoes the hopeful work that has already been taken up on the Hill since the climate plan was adopted. But all is not yet lost. It is my hope that the students, the staff, faculty, and community will rise up and simply not allow this change of course. And if they need help from We Are Seneca Lake, we'll help in any way we can. We know how to fight. Yeah. In closing, We Are Seneca Lake is de dedicated to shutting down Crestwood's dangerous storage plans, which threaten a source of drinking water for 100,000 people. But we are also committed to and work to shut it all down. The pipelines, the compressor stations, the coal plants, the waste disposal sites, and on and on and on ad nauseum. I invite you to join us by going to wearesenecalake.com. We are not all about arrests. There are many ways you can help us, many roles to play. If, you would li if you'd like more information, uh, ask during the open discussion. Catch me afterwards. Um, we need you. My very last thought, my very last thought, <laughs> uh, the irrefutable message out of Le Bourget is the time to act is now. And the time is like right now. <laughs> so let's get to work, eh? Thank you. Well, with those final inspiring words, um, we would love to hear more from the audience now for questions.
All right, so. Uh, thank you for putting this wonderful event on. I have a question, I guess, specifically aimed at Bob Howarth. Uh, sorry, Bob. Uh, we, uh, I'm from the town of Dryden. Uh, we had some significant effect earlier, and just part of the reason, anyway, why Tompkins County might be known around the world. Uh, we now have in the town of Dryden, and in Tompkins County in general, uh, at least two major projects and several others that are pressing that are natural gas infrastructure related in particular. Uh, and I'd like to get your thoughts on what we might do specifically, and I know you've put some work into studying some of these, uh, what we, what you recommend we do uh, for those of us who have the power to do anything to deal with the multinational companies again that are who we'd be up against in these things, uh, with specifically with reference to the West Dryden Road natural gas uh, pipeline, uh, which would expand uh, natural gas service throughout Tompkins County, uh, throughout much of Tompkins County, and also uh, with respect to the gasification of the power plant on Cayuga Lake. Let me speak to the science. Before COP21, you know, I think the argument was about uh, coal versus natural gas and which has the bigger greenhouse gas footprint. And, and I strongly believe my research shows, other research shows that natural gas has a larger greenhouse gas footprint if it comes from shale than does coal if you correctly account for methane emissions. I have no doubt about that. Coming out of COP21, though, I, I, I was at the anti-fracking event. Uh, I spoke on this research. Kevin Anderson, uh, so one of the leading climate scientists from the United Kingdom, was there. And he said, you know, quite aside from, from Howard's methane argument, we can't afford shale gas anymore because of the carbon dioxide. We cannot put any more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We need to get rid of all fossil fuels. And the idea of natural gas as a bridge fuel, even if Haworth is wrong, which I'm, which I'm not, he, he said, is passed. And again, as, as I briefly said in my remarks uh, a while ago, we have to reduce carbon dioxide emissions now, but the climate will continue to warm for the next 30 to 40 years at its current rate, no matter what we do for carbon dioxide, because of the inherent lags and the interactions of the oceans and, and all with, with carbon dioxide. That's not true for methane. If we stop methane emissions now, we will slow global warming now. We can keep the planet below 1.5 degrees C for several decades into the future. We can keep it well below two, which is what the COP agreement says, probably for the rest of this century if we work aggressively on it. But we've got to get rid of natural gas to do that. So the idea of building any infrastructure to promote further use of natural gas now is crazy. We should not be building pipelines. We should not be supporting Crestwood. We should not be repowering power plants. We should be putting our resources into the infrastructure we need for the renewable future that has got to start now. Uh, two, I guess, comments and then um, a question um, of two experiences. My name's Anna Kellis. I guess we'll, everybody say their name. Um, I am teaching right now at Cornell, and I had an experience today that I wanted to share um, and then ask you know, your response to that, I guess. Um, I teach a class, and I asked if anybody knew in the classroom what the Trans-Pacific um, Partnership was, TPP. And one person raised her hand, and she was the other teacher in the room. And then I asked if they knew what NAFTA was, and only four people raised their hand, and it's a class of 55 students. And I asked if anybody had followed the COP21, and only six people raised their hands out of 55 students. So, and this is Cornell. So I guess we do need, we are Seneca Lake up there, but I think also it's part of an education, and I, and I wanted to share that with the entire room because that was the experience, and I don't see many uh, Cornell students in this room. Um, but I'm having another experience as a legislator, and, it's, and this is where my question comes from. Um, I've been connecting with the building trades, and I've been, my heart is, is breaking because I'm, as I'm talking to them, particularly recently, the electricians and then the plumbers and steam fitters, 75 of their guys out of 500 have been out of work for a year and a half. There's tremendous amount of emotion and pressure and desire for their, their guys to have work. So when we talk about, you know, let's not build this infrastructure, I am 100% there. 
But what I would love to see is them in the room and us having conversations with them. And what do we say to them? I and mean, what do you say to them? What is the alternate that we can provide for them? There's hydroelectric potentially. There's what do, what do, what do you say to them when, when they say we're aching, we're out of jobs, we can't feed our family? So. Yeah, that's a great, great point. Uh, and let me just say one of the things, I gave a couple of presentations at, at COP21. One of them was to uh, international union organizations. Sean Sweeney, he used to work for Cornell, the Worker Institute. He now works for uh, City University of New York. But he invited me to come and talk to the unions. He's invited me before to other union events, and I'm teaching a short course uh, with him in March on climate change for unions. Uh, in my experience, uh, you know, the, the union people want jobs. They're highly trained. There are jobs out here for this transition which needs to happen. I, I gave a talk at one of Sean's events, not at COP, but maybe uh, nine months or so ago, and there was an older gentleman there who was a major leader in the International Boilermakers Union. He represents the guys who run coal-burning power plants. And I was told to expect a hostile audience. I didn't get that at all. This guy came up to me at the end. He told, he, he, he put his arm around me. He told the whole group, this is what we need. This is the future we need. The boilermakers unions are all in their 50s and 60s. And, and they know the days of coal burning power plants are over. And he said, the vision which Professor Howarth gave in terms of this alternative energy moving forward, he goes, I could see myself when I was young doing that. I can see people like me who are young doing it. I can see our union getting involved in training people in their 20s to do it and rebuilding the movement. So I think there's, uh, you know, obviously there are a lot of union people who are just scared and therefore reactionary. So I think we need to reach out further, but uh, I'm, I'm optimistic on that front. That'd be great. <laughs> Oh, I, I would just, um, my own feeling is that um, until we have a price on carbon, a lot of these questions will remain local and anecdotal, which doesn't make them any less painful for the people involved with them. But a, a kind of global will to a price on carbon is very difficult to imagine. It is in some of the individual nations, INDCs, but the question there and maybe, I don't Allison could talk about this too, is why are we even talking about uh, uh, goals for uh, reaching uh, net zero by nation states? Why is the nation state even the framework within these goals should be met? It makes really not much logical sense. So again, a lot of what you're talking about, to, to me, requires some kind of really radical shift in in our economy, and I don't think it can, I personally don't think it can happen through either regulation or through sort of local or small uh, forms of, of change. To me, it, we, we need a radical change, something like a carbon standard as the way the gold standard used to be. John. Yeah. Um, just a couple of comments. Um, there are Cornell students in the room. I see a lot of them in the back. Um, uh, and uh, I, I do think if we start uh, replumbing the society, we need to replumb the economy. And there needs to be economic um, incentives. It cannot work on the backs of the employees. That's very clear. But I think everybody wants to be part of the solution. Um, and nobody wants to stay behind and be part of the problem. So I think uh, everybody would be on board if the economic opportunities are there and they can be there. Lauren, while you're getting the question, I also want to just point out that we have a university climate change seminar that's starting next Monday. And it is a, a seminar class. We have over 100 students registered for that, which is amazing. I'm really excited about that, but we're also opening it up to the public. There's a WebEx option, so you feel free to come up to campus and hear these great lectures, but also if you can't make it to campus, you can log in by WebEx. I'm Joe Wilson. I'm 73 years old, so I've been voting in national elections for a long time. I've been observing the political process for a long time. I have to uh, disagree with Professor Pincus. Um, if it's not done locally, it's not going to be done because it ain't being done at the national level right now. So my question becomes, what would you, following along with the notion that a new gas pipe in the 
part of Tompkins County, expanding the use of natural gas in the county is crazy. What would you say to our political leaders on the local and the county level who with their private industry chamber of commerce colleagues are promoting gas-based construction of large buildings and residential complexes and industrial buildings? Yep. One of the major uses of natural gas is for heating. Certainly, the, it's the major single use in the state of New York is for space heating and, and uh, domestic hot water heating. And so let me give you an example. Something like 30% uh, of uh, the natural gas uh, that's used for uh, home use in the state of New York is used for domestic hot water heating. We can replace uh, domestic hot water uh, heating with high efficiency electric heat pumps installed cost is somewhere between $1,200 to $2,000 per home. The payback period for that for an average homeowner is in the average about three years or less. So it's a really low hanging fruit for reducing our gas use. Uh, any new construction, I think it's a crime to allow it to be heated with, with any fossil fuel. We, buildings should be either, uh, you know, if it's a residential home, we should require that it be well insulated and, and heated with a heat pump. It's cost effective for people to do that. They just don't know that. This is a place where governments could intervene. And we have a bigger problem at Cornell. We have a big campus that's uh, difficult to heat. You know, uh, my, my own home, with my wife's back there, we, we've converted. Our house is carbon neutral. We use a heat pump. It's cost effective. The scale of something like Cornell, it's hard to do because we would need, I'm told, something like 10,000 uh, uh, wells to do it. That's very difficult. So we need to be more creative at Cornell. There are people working on trying to make that happen. But uh, we, we just, I don't think we can allow the continued uh, status quo of doing things the way we've done them for the 20th century. We need to realize that climate change is real. There are alternatives. We need to push for those. We need to help those who, uh, are financially challenged, find ways to, to, to do it, and I'm all in favor of that, but that's not an excuse for not moving ahead. Hi, I'm Sandy Padalka. Um, I just, I worry a lot about the TPP, and I don't know, I, I would just like to know, you hear all these horror stories, can anyone comment on what effect the TPP, if it's actually passed, might have on our ability as a country to enact what we need to do to, um, you know, to meet the demands of climate change? Um, is it not relevant because we're not going to get anything done on a national level anyway, or do you think it's really, you know, really important? I think it's probably relevant. I think you're seeing that. We've had a, quest, a request to stand up when you're speaking so people can see you in the back. You, if you could just stand, Bob, while you're talking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think, at least in my case, I don't have the expertise to answer that question, and I, I think that's what you're seeing from the rest of us. So, you know, uh, if, if you stick to the science of methane or climate or alternative energy, I, I feel on pretty firm ground. You get into the politics. I have my own personal belief, but I'm not qualified to, to give you an expert opinion on it. Uh, yeah, I, my question follows through on pretty much everything that's been said so far. Yesterday I participated in a webinar uh, funded by the EPA on our government's clean power plan entitled Environmental Justice. And they define that as keeping uh, fossil fuel power plants open with gas instead of with coal. And the only, only point at which they measure pollution is carbon dioxide at the point of intentional combustion. And if this is what our EPA is promoting, they're not looking at life cycles, they're not looking at methane. I'm very concerned about carbon prices also being CO2 at the point of intentional combustion, not life cycle, not also methane. So I think this really is a political question, not a scientific question. Anybody who pays attention to the science knows the science. Um, and we can certainly, and I, I've been arrested three times, I mean, there's a lot we can do locally, but we're up against not just the disinformation in the media, but our so-called progressive government and its Environmental Protection Agency is promoting actively natural gas. So how do we address that? I can take it. I can try. Yeah, well, Alice, why don't you start? Yeah. Go ahead. 
So, I mean, politically, um, the government can only do what's what's been passed into law. So we have a Clean Air Act on the books. If you look at the INDC that we submitted to Paris, we're going to do everything that we agreed to do, um, which is uh, very succinctly um, intends to achieve, the U.S. intends to achieve an economy-wide target of reducing its greenhouse gas emissions by 26 to 28 percent below its 2005 level in 2025 and make its best efforts to reduce its emissions by 28 percent. That's a very short sentence. And the way that we're going to do that is through the Clean Air Act. So we can only do what we have on the books to do. And I think the Obama administration is really pushing every avenue that they have available through the executive orders or using the Energy Policy Act. Um, but we have a very hostile Congress right now. And we're not going to see any other comprehensive climate uh, legislation passed in this Congress. So we need to, if that's important to us, work around the country. And there's different ways to do that to get other laws put into place. Or what it was really unique in Paris was that um, local mayors were there. Michael Bloomberg, as the past mayor of New York City, was there. A lot of local mayors of cities around the world were there. Um, there was civil society there. We need to not only look to government, but uh, local government, our state government, and um, businesses and what they can do. Well, let me just add a little amendment to that, I think, because in fact, half of all of the carbon that we pull out of the United States, whether it's you know the whole unholy trinity, coal, oil, natural gas, comes out of public lands. This land is you know your land and my land. And that is something that's solely under the control of our president. He could tomorrow, with a stroke of the pen, declare that we're not, we're leaving all the carbon in the ground on the land that belongs to the public, and that would leave half of all the carbon in the ground. And so that is a project that I'm involved in with another hat that I wear as the science advisor for Americans Against Fracking. Now, policy matters, and Congress matters, and, all the, and the EPA does matter. So something else that we're doing, which I'd like to all invite you to, to, to consider being part of, is at the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia in July, Americans Against Fracking is going to be gathering as part of a huge tent, demanding the De Democratic Party embrace renewables and turn its back on carbon as a part of the platform rapid decarbonization. So we will be part of the media message and the narrative that comes out of the, the DNC in, in July. Um, it also occurs to me, and this is the thought that I came back with from Paris, that because I, I'm, a, I'm a scientist, so I think about data, and I think about taking data to our elected officials um, and making policy that's based on good data. I kind of work in that interface. But the new idea I came back with is, is how you can sometimes, when you're stuck with bad policy or, or blind government, is to go around them to the economics. And that's what we're seeing with the business community trying to look for strong signals to redirect investment dollars. So just today, for example, there's a new industry report out from the oil and gas industry announcing that as a warning to investors that renewable forms of energy are now out-competing liquefied natural gas projects. So as a consequence, these analysts agreed that global uh, LNG markets are likely to be oversupplied. Um, and it goes on from there. And so what we're starting to see is that this old idea that we have, that the, somehow the reliable form of energy is, is lighting carbon on fire and everything else is sort of intermittent and fickle, that's beginning to change in the public imagination. And our job is to catalyze, catalyze that change. Let's make re renewables be the steady eddy, right, that we can really depend on um, for the future. It's, it's indefinite. It doesn't kill people. It doesn't kill our climate, doesn't kill our kids. And let's work on the unions and labor with that message. The, the document that's going around that I helped write about the health impacts of fracking, also there's a lot of occupational health data in there. These jobs, these carbon jobs are killing jobs. They, they're killing workers and they're often not uh, getting health insurance. They're often not um, in, a, in a position to be that sick. Um, by, the, by the time they are, they're off the payroll. 
And so that's been a really important message, even in We Are Seneca Lake, um, of which I'm also a part, where we actually brought Renovus Energy up to the gates of Crestwood. Not only did their employees blockade, but their HR director was up there calling over the fence saying, we have good paying jobs for you, <laughs> right? And so this is the kind of pivotal turning point that I think we can all be engaged in and kind of do an end run around the EPA and the Obama administration until we can get better policy in place. In other words, we're not stuck. We still have pathways to go down. I, I agree with what Sandra said, but I'd also like to uh, politely disagree with my colleague, uh, Allison. Uh, the, the administration has the legal authority to regulate methane. It's a greenhouse gas. The courts have ruled that they have the authority to do so. And in fact, they are starting to do so. They've just been really, really slow. And they're way off the mark in their accounting. They severely underestimate the amount of methane. No reputable scientist would disagree with me when I say that. There's an increasing amount of evidence. The Inspector General of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has heavily criticized them for the way they go about doing that. The amount of methane that is leaking is at least two times and perhaps five times more than they say. And then one has to compare that methane leakage with carbon dioxide in order to have a meaningful policy approach. And they are using science that predates the Kyoto Protocol, which very, very much downplays it. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in their last synthesis report from 2013, said that there was no scientific basis for doing that, and one should use time frames, metrics that are appropriate for the questions. Coming out of COP21, it's clear you want to use a short-term metric, and you throw those things together, and EPA is underestimating the problem by 10 to 20-fold. That's what they're doing. People at COP21 got that. I went to a lot of sessions, which people knew that. I talked to the head of the climate office in the White House. He understands and gets that. And he told me that the administration is slowly moving towards better accounting. It just takes time. So I do think the power is there. I think eventually it will happen. I don't have any idea why it's taking as long as it is. One, one other thing, the uh, uh, International Standards Organization is moving on setting an international standard for how methane would be evaluated. That would feed into the outcome of the Paris Accord and would force the United States to, to, uh, to, to change the way they're accounting. And again, there's a lot of presentation at the COP21 about that. I'd be very surprised if those standards aren't adopted within, say, three years from now. In contrast with uh, Cornell, I understand that Janet Napolitano, the chancellor of the entire University of California university system, went to COP21 to talk about uh, their commitment and their progress to carbon neutrality by 2020. And I'm wondering if um, that had an impact uh, did anybody hear about it? Uh, what did the University of California system statement, um, did it do something? Yeah, I think it had an impact. The number is uh, 2025, not, not uh, 2020. So 10 years, which is highly ambitious. Uh, University of California is making quite a, quite a big deal about that. Uh, I, I, I didn't see her presentation, but I did see a lot of academics who were there. A lot of people, the faculty at the University of California are ecstatic. They are energized. I wish I felt that way. <laughs> um, this question is not for one of the panelists. It's for Barbara Lifton. Um, first, I want to say thank you for co-sponsoring uh, a carbon tax bill in the New York State Assembly, along with Kevin Cahill. Um, I have three short questions. What inspired you for that? Did something in particular, some other document or, or some other person inspire you? Uh, number two, do you think there's any chance that it will pass? And number three, what can we do to help you get it passed? Barbara? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, so it's a, it's a Cahill Lifton bill. Um, just introduced, I guess, Jordan in December, I guess we put it in, he put it in. Um, October, okay. So we just started session in January. Uh, it's, it's pretty new. Um, we're working with advocates, obviously having worked on fracking, having 
hung out with Bob Howarth a lot and <laughs> understanding the methane issues and, and where we are. Um, Mark Hertzgard's great book really highlighting the crisis we're in. Um, you know, we just, as we talked, we said, you know, carbon tax is probably a good idea. People here were talking about it. People were writing to me about it. Um, so, um, frankly, advocacy groups came to us saying, let's, let's talk about putting in a bill. And I said, yeah, let, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, so, you know, you need the outside, as we found out in fracking. You don't just work by yourself in legislature. You need people outside pushing and working with you. So it looked like a good marriage, and there was going to be energy outside to start pushing on a carbon tax. Um, so it's in. Uh, we don't have, you know, the Republicans control the Senate, and not, not dissimilar from Washington. They're not big on these things. Um, um, John Flanagan, the head, says he doesn't believe in climate change. Uh, so they're not exactly pushing strongly. Um, so there is no majority sponsor. There's a minority sponsor, a Democrat in the Senate. I, yes, Jordan? Parker, Senate. Kevin Parker, has the bill in the Senate, uh, which means it's not going to go anywhere in the Senate unless it gets a majority sponsor, a Republican at this point. Um, I would urge people to contact area senators. We have three uh, majority senators, Republican senators in Tompkins County, uh, one of whom I guess just announced his retirement, uh, Mike Nazolio. Uh, but we have uh, Jim Seward, Senator Seward, and Senator O'Mara. Um, so people should definitely talk to them about picking up the carbon bill. Go educate them. Sit, you know, take time and say, we, you know, where are you on this? And uh, take the time to try to educate people and give them the information you have. And you know, you have to work, try to work with people. And they're they're the ones in office. They're the ones that have the votes. So it's always good to try to try to get them aboard. Um, and you know, it's going to be. It's not going to happen overnight. I, I mean, unless you know, the revolution happens this year. I. And, you know, I always, you know, you never know what kind of, you know, I do think there's a big tidal wave happening, but um, our, our Senate has not shown a lot of inclination. And, you know, this is a huge issue, obviously. It's a heavy lift, as we call it. And usually it helps to have the governor aboard a heavy lift if you're going to, because the governor ultimately has to sign bills into law. Uh, so it's also good to talk to the governor's people, his environmental people. People should come down, ask for a meeting, and... Um, let me know if you're not able to get, you know, not that I have a lot of pull there, but maybe I can help get a meeting with, uh, we just had Basil uh, Sagos, the head of the DEC, in a hearing the other day, and see, he admits, I said, do you think climate crisis is the greatest problem we're facing? And he said, yes, absolutely. So, you know, there are people to talk to down there and try to get the governor to uh, get interested in a carbon tax. Because it is a market, right? The people are saying this is the market solution. So if you believe in the market solution to things, then you ought to be a board of carbon tax. So it's going to take a lot of hard work. Just like fracking, it's going to take a big push and a lot of hard work from a lot of people. But I do think it's um, a hopeful area for people to work in. OK? Thank you. Um, my name is Bob Rossi. I'm tabling for We Are Seneca Lake back there. And thanks to having well over 200 people in this room, that tabling is kind of a joke. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, there is a sign-up list, and I'll happily have that outside for people who are leaving. Uh, quick show of hands. If you have um, been part of an action for We Are Seneca Lake or part of a support team, please hold your hand up. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. I was expecting that. And th that's why we're known globally. Um, but we're known for those actions, what a lot of people don't realize um, is all the other work that We Are Seneca Lake does, organizing buses to Albany for um, a rally day, or we also have an amazing information source that currently has over 2,000 people on this email list. And if you are not on that email list and you are in this room, then you probably want to be on that email list. Every week, uh, an email goes out with all the great news related to fracked gas infrastructure, not just at Seneca Lake, but statewide infrastructure build out, national, uh, if you want to learn about the anything, Southern California gas company um, debacle, that's in there. And as Karen Pincus was mentioning, in our news, it is overshadowed uh, shadowed by totally trivial political shenanigans. So please sign up, um, and you probably, I don't know, you can find me and sign up outside, or just go to wearesenicalake.com and click the Join button. That's really just joining the newsletter. It's just a step. Um, and I do have a question. 
I'm wondering <laughs> if there is a stated plan for COP22 and COP23. In particular, I'm wondering if there is a plan for a check-in on hitting any milestones towards the 2035 targets. So um, there, there's work already going on now, and there will there are subsidiary bodies of the COP that will be meeting in June and preparing for the next COP. Um, there, written into this COP is that there will be a review of all of those INDCs after five years. And so that was a really important thing to get written in, um, that this has to be a transparent and flexible process and that we have to, in order to keep warming below two degrees C, we have to reassess those um, international commitments on a regular basis. The, the, the other aspect of that is the, the COP asked the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to weigh in on what uh, steps would be necessary to really meet the 1.5 target because the current agreements are going to take us to 3.5 <coughs> to 4. So the IPCC is supposed to try and weigh in on that within 18 months. And then uh, another, what, three and a half years after that, there'll be an assessment of where we sit. Yeah, and, and then just to give you a sort of framing on this. so. The beauty of this treaty and what made it all possible to, for everyone to sign is that the nation states came in with commitments that they had already agreed to. But when you added up all the cuts that all the nation states agreed to, we're on track to 3.5 degrees warming, right? So, but if we tried to force nations to agree to, to more, it, the whole thing was going to fall apart. So instead, they signed in with these cuts, but there's a built-in so-called ratchet mechanism and a so-called stock taking, which means that as time goes by, you have to up your commitment. And then you meet every now and then, Morocco, is that right, Allison? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, then, and then in five years, I'm not sure where it is in five years, but there's a big stock taking where you see everyone shows their new plan and it's supposed to just get, it's supposed to snowball, right? As, as we close the door on carbon and as renewables ramp up and, and everything gets cheaper and cheaper and there's this big sort of economic switch. I mean, the race is between trying to flip the economics before we flip the climate, right? And, and, and the treaty takes that into account and hopefully it all will work. But we, members of civil society and scientists, have to also be the ratchet mechanism and hold our own individual nations accountable for these commitments that they're making, otherwise they're just numbers on a, on a piece of paper. Is this on? Yeah, I'm on. Uh, I, have, I have two questions. One is, um, in the context of setting goals, if you have any commentary, it seems to me that you know, it's always great to have these short-term goals to assess how you're moving. But it seems like right now, a lot of the short-term goals are actually short-circuiting uh, the efforts. We just were talking about um, trying to get off of gas and trying to reduce emissions. So we can get a 25% reduction in emissions if you accept the wrong accounting and not, not uh, Bob's accounting. But if, if you accept that, yeah, we can switch over to gas and it's going to do a savings. But by doing that, you built all this new infrastructure and you have guaranteed that you cannot meet your long-term goals of getting past 50% renewables to 100% renewables by 2050. So one question is, do you have any commentary on how to um, pressure the, the government groups that are setting these goals and, and char charting courses to make sure that they're setting interim goals that actually match long-term goals that we need to have? I think a critical part of that, again, coming out of COP21, is the recognition that um, you have to focus on methane short term and not just on, on carbon dioxide. And the IPCC is clearly looking at that. There are a lot of both formal and informal side events talking about the need to get at short-lived climate pollutants. I sat in inadvertently on a negotiating session with the, the uh, head of the White House Climate Office on that where they're talking explicitly about it. And I actually think that the White House and perhaps the EPA are starting to back off of this idea of natural gas because it isn't simply a switching, we need to get rid of methane. And they hadn't really been thinking about that if, if you're looking at a longer term climate goal. But COP focuses that short time attention span on 1.5. And as the political realities come to, to 
uh, interface with the scientific uh, realities behind there, I'm cautiously optimistic that natural gas will fall by the wayside. Uh, just to respond also, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. I actually think it's a really difficult question to answer because there are nations that have, um, whose carbon emissions aren't really uh, that sub substantive, but they have, for example, say, uh, ruminant emissions. So, you know, the way that they would reduce their emissions could threaten food security and agriculture. They have a whole another set of problems to face, which is why I was saying the nation state framing is very problematic because it it assumes like every single nation has to deal with its own stuff and but there's no kind of overall issue. So like for us here, of course, it's very easy to focus on natural gas, but in other countries the focus is elsewhere. Um, and even, for example, the European Union functions as one negotiating unit, but there are so many differences within the European countries. Poland, I think, is something like 90% dependent on coal. Um, for them to reduce uh, their use of coal will, will bring about a huge change in their country, but how do you negotiate that with all the rest of the European countries? So that's why, for me, when you put all of this together and your head starts to explode, I also think we are going to have to start talking about ways of either um, you know, capturing carbon, sequestering it, um, dealing with it in some ways, perhaps um, you know, in a temporary mode. And, and it's, it's very taboo to talk about that because that's, that, that raises some you know, very depressing issues about countries not being able to meet their targets. I mean, the other thing we didn't talk a lot about is that the agreement um, requires developed countries to send $100 billion annually to help developing countries with adaptation and mitigation. Mm -hmm. So if we all, if all of our developed countries live up to that and provide funding, there are incredible mechanisms, a lot of projects that we heard a lot about. UNDP has a small grant program. We heard just hundreds of events every day of the work going on in African countries to help um, countries with those exact questions. But we just need funding and research and uh, training and mm -hmm. new Yeah, and I can follow up on that. Um, as Alison mentioned in her statement before, that there was a lot of buzz, although I said soils is not mentioned and agriculture not mentioned in the accord, um, if you went through the side event and to the booths um, of the observers, you found a lot of talk about agriculture, uh, much more than five years ago in, in Copenhagen. Um, and, and that was really uplifting. Um, and and uh, there are short-term goals that, that help, and they need to go together with food security, um, not endangering farmers, but working with them and uh, we have shown in, in Africa in, in various places that food security interventions on a national scale can actually help mitigate climate change and adapt to climate change. Um, that's not a contradiction. Um, and, uh, and, and we can incorporate agriculture um, in the climate solution and at the same time promote food security. And that can be done at an affordable price and um, climate funding can help with that, um, but uh, in this country, that uh, nobody wants to go that um, that direction, at least not uh, at the UN negotiating table, um, and that's also something that we need to fix. Okay, so I venture to guess that there's a lot of Cornell alumni, faculty, and students and staff here, and so this seems like a really wonderful local. You can do it. I noticed that the new president of Taiwan is a second time president in Taiwan, Cornell grad. Um, Cornell's image around the world matters. Um, I, this seems the place where we could really affect change. And uh, so be nice to know what might happen from here that's going to try to react to this new terrible policy that apparently <laughs> we just heard about from Colleen. Do you want to speak? Do you want to speak for it? Yeah, Cornell, you can go. Do you want to answer? I'll start on maybe a little bit of a different tact on that question. So I'm on the 
uh, a group that's been looking at Cornell's carbon footprint now for a couple of years and actually am part of the senior leadership team that is trying to respond to the new mission under President Garrett. And I certainly, um, you know, personally, um, I would love to see a number out there because I think motivationally it's hugely helpful. But I also understand where President Garrett is coming from. And part of it is, at least where she's coming from in terms of what the opportunity is. There's two different sides to this, uh, of her, her approach. Part of her approach I agree with. So the side I agree with is that 2035 is actually too slow. And, it, and that date maybe lets us backslide. Why not go for even more aggressively? So one way to interpret her message is, let Cornell leverage all of its expertise to try to find solutions as rapidly as possible. So if I take her at her word and move on that mission, that's how I'm behaving. Simultaneously, personally, I'm also part of the nudge group saying, dates are great, and maybe 2035, much like COP, wants to be a date now, and maybe that date actually moves down, down the road. But if we take her at her word and work on what the policy is right now, there's a tremendous opportunity to use Cornell campus as a living laboratory to test all kinds of opportunities that get us where we need to go. And so there are lots of conversations around that that range across, as Bob mentioned, we've got 30% of our heat um, coming from essentially, uh, right now purely from, uh, from methane. Um, how do we get off that? We're not going to do it with ground source heat pumps. We're going to do it by going deep into the earth potentially. So we're interested in studying what is the opportunity to go down about three to five kilometers, pump water through the bedrock, which is now at about 130 degrees Celsius, heat that water up to 130 and run it through baseboard hot water heating. If that works, we just got rid of a third of Cornell's methane, probably uh, Bert lands in the room, but there's a number, it's probably more than a third, right, Bert, of, of our methane, because electricity is already significantly renewable. So we're looking at 50% of our methane, probably, by just doing that one process. There's a lot of concern about, hey, we have technology we could do now, but to the point of the West Dryden gas pipeline, if we invest in uh, you know, 10,000 ground source heat pumps right now, that infrastructure is in and we won't try to come up with a solution that doesn't work just for Cornell, but works for Syracuse, Rochester, Downstate, Virginia, and replaces all of those coal mine jobs with now green agriculture that's local East Coast agriculture instead of trucking agriculture from the West Coast to feed us in the winter. So the trickle down economics of this kind of approach are tremendous. That's just one example of what is going on. So I encourage people to push for what they think is right with Cornell to be doing, but I don't want people to think that just because you're hearing one message, Cornell is sitting and doing nothing. We're actually out on the forefront very aggressively pursuing opportunities, and the Cornell Climate Action Plan, which has been in place since 2009, is up on the website. Um, take a look, help all of us push to make that happen as fast as possible. 2035 is too late. So I think with that, we're out of time. But thank you very, very much. <laughs> Oh
Then can I walk beside you? I have come here to lose the smoke, and I feel to be a cog in something turning. Well, maybe it is just a time. Back to the gods.